The only way we will have victory is just how you've heard it. Amen. In Jesus. Victory is in Jesus. Well, are you happy to be here, church? Yes. Amen. In the foyer out here and in the little hallway next to the water fountain, you'll see some flyers for the meetings that will begin next Saturday evening. And if you, I invite you to take as many as you want. And we have a lot of more back in the office, so don't feel that you're taking all of them. There is plenty of more to take, to distribute to your friends, to your neighbors, to anyone. And, uh, and we, will beginning, we will be beginning next Saturday evening at 7 o'clock. And by the grace of God, Eddie will be presenting the Bible truths that we are so familiar with. But yet, it is always, always important to go over again. And uh, as, as Alicia had mentioned, I do want to again just reiterate a happy Mother's Day for the mothers, which will be tomorrow. And because I know my mother will be listening in a couple of hours, I want to wish her a happy Mother's Day. And I love you, Mom, because number one, by the grace of God and by her influence, I am the person that I am. I am not perfect, but I know that I am better off by her being my mother. And so I thank, I thank God for, for her wisdom, for, for her prayers, and God's grace pouring um, on our family. So we are continuing now with Daniel. And we're going to finish today looking at Daniel. We're going to finish today looking at Daniel. Daniel chapter 8 is where we're going to begin. Daniel chapter 8. And I'd like to ask and begin with a question. What would you say the most important thing that you have would be? What would you say is the most important thing that you have? What would you say? Okay, people are going like this. Okay, the Word of God. All right, anything else? Jesus, okay. Anything else? The Holy Spirit. Friends, I would like to propose to you, I want to talk to you this morning, that the most important thing that we have is time. Is time. Because what we do with our time, you know, if we had no time, then the Bible would be irrelevant. We had no time to read it. If we didn't have any time, we couldn't listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. We couldn't accept Jesus. For God has given us time. And praise the Lord for that. I want to invite you to read in, in the back of your bulletin at, at the meditation. There. In the back of the bulletin, the meditation. It's from Christ's Object Lessons 342. Our time belongs to who? God. To God. Every moment is His and we are under the, sol the most solemn obligation to improve it to His glory. Of no talent He has given, will He require a more strict account than of our time. Wow. Of no talent has he given, will he require a more strict account than of our time. The value of time is beyond computation. Christ regarded every moment as precious as it is thus that we should regard it. Life is too short to be trifled, trifle away. We have but a few days of probation in which to prepare for eternity, friends. Time is a blessing and one of the most important things that God has given us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, help me. May your Holy Spirit speak to every single heart here. In Jesus' name, amen. The book of Daniel is about time. It's all about time. Throughout, 
Through prophecies, we learn that God is not controlled by history, but rather that He controls history. We see that in, in the book of Daniel as a review. Uh, I put here these two posters. This is from Daniel chapter 2, and this is from Daniel chapter what? 7. Very good. Am I in the Seventh-day Adventist church, or we are not familiar with these <laughs> images? From Daniel chapter 7 and Daniel chapter 2, and we learn in Daniel chapter, chapter 2 that God controls history. God is in control. So during your worst moments, friends, re keep that in mind. Keep in mind that nothing catches God off guard. Nothing catches God off guard. So if you get fired, if you get sick, if you lose a, if you lose a spouse or lose a child, God knew it was going to happen. It doesn't catch him by surprise. So your mind should be at rest knowing that God already knew. And trusting that God knows what he is doing. The Bible has told us what is going to happen. We already know what the events are going to happen. And we have, we have been talking about end time events. And the more I read the Bible and the more I study it, the more I know that God is using time to get my attention, to mold me into His character. The more you read the Bible, especially Psalms, especially the book of Psalms, I've come to learn that God is using time to get my attention, but most importantly, to mold me into His image, to His image. See, God is going to use time here in the book of Daniel to test Daniel's faith and trust. He's going to use time. And God is going to use time to test your faith and to see and to get you ready for what is coming. So if you join me there in Jeremiah chapter 25, we're going to see a couple of prophecies that Daniel was very familiar with. Jeremiah chapter 25. Jeremiah chapter 25. 25 verse 11 Daniel trusted the word of God and he knew that God's truth God's word is truth when he gave this interpretation and the dream you re remember there Daniel says the dream and the interpretation is sure is certain he was confident in God's word so when, Jer when Daniel read here in Jeremiah chapter 25 verse 11 when Jeremiah predicts, he says, And this whole land, talking about Israel, shall be a desolation and an astonishment. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon for how long? Seven for 70 years. For 70 years. Just look there in the same book, Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 10. Same book, Jeremiah 29, verse 10. Here, Daniel is also familiar with this. He says, it says here, For thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit and perform my good works toward you and, and cause you to return to this place. So Daniel was familiar that he wasn't going to leave Babylon early. He had studied and he knew that God's word was sure. That's why if you, if, if you look there in Daniel chapter 9, Daniel chapter 9, verse 2, Daniel writes this down. He said, In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of these of the years specified by the word of the Lord given through Jeremiah the prophet. We, we just read those words, right? That he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. See, Daniel was familiar with how long he would be in Babylon. And he knew that he was going to be there a long time. So he didn't consider or didn't hope, I hope we get to leave early. I hope something happens that interrupts. No, he knew that at least 70 years they were going to be there. Because God had prophesied. God had prophesied. It. But yet, Daniel is given a vision there in Daniel chapter 8 that is going to shake him up. It's going to shake him up. Daniel chapter 8, verse 3 through 8. Follow along with me there in Daniel chapter 8. He's given a vision. 
It says in verse 3, Then I lifted my eyes and saw there standing before the river was a ram which had two horns, and the two horns were high, but one was higher. Don't miss that. One horn was higher than the other. And the higher one came up last. I saw the ram pushing westward, northward, and southward, so that no beast could withstand him, nor was there any that could deliver from his hand, but he did according to his will and became great. And as I was considering, suddenly a male goat, a male goat came from the west across the surface of the whole earth without touching the ground. Notice, it's so fast, it's not touching the ground. And the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. Then he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing before the river and ran at him with furious power. And I saw him confronting the ram. He was moved with rage against him, attacked the ram and broke his two horns. There was no power in him to withstand him, but he cast him down to the ground and trampled him and there was no one that could deliver the ram from the goat. In verse 8, Therefore the male goat grew very great and when he became strong, the large horn, don't forget this, was what? Broken and in place of it, four notables came up toward the winds of heaven. So here, Daniel is given a vision of a ram with two horns and one horn was higher than the other one. And all of a sudden, what comes? Speedingly fast. A goat. So fast, it's not even touching the ground. We can say it's flying. And what does it do? It rams the ram. So much that it breaks off its horn and tramples over it. But yet, that one big horn that the goat had, it broke off and four horns came out. So Daniel was given this vision. We're not going to get into the details of the ram and the goat in this sermon. We are during the, during the evangelistic meetings. So then, notice verses 9 through 12. 9 through 12, the vision continues. And out of one of them came a little horn which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land. And it grew up to the host of heaven. And it cast down some of the hosts and some of the stars to the ground and trampled them. He even exalted himself high as the prince of the most, of the, of the host. And by him the daily sacrifices were taken away and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Verse 12, because of transgression, an army was given over to the horn to oppose the daily sacrifices, to cast truth down to the ground. He did all this and prospered and prospered and prospered. So first, there between verses 3 through 8, we see this war between the goat and the ram. And then verses 9 through 12, we see a little horn that is very similar, if you caught that, to the, little, to the little horn in Daniel 7. And now Daniel is given, is given the interpretation, what it means, there in verse 20 and 21. Okay? 20 and 21. 20 says, The ram which you saw having the two horns, they are the kings of who? Media, Media and Persia. Oh. And verse, verse 21, And the male goat is a kingdom of Greece. The large horn that is between its eyes is the first king. This dream, this vision, goes right along with Daniel 2 and Daniel 7. Because in Daniel 2, do you, you, you remember the kingdoms that these metals represent? Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and Rome divided the feet. And as a review of last Sabbath, this uh, vision of the four beasts the lion representing Babylon, the bear representing Medo-Persia. Do you remember in Daniel 7 after that the bear, it was one side higher than the other? How were the horns? One higher than the other. And it tells us that the ram represents Medo-Persia. The Bible tells us right there. Goes right along with the bear. And then the leopard representing Greece, the next kingdom after Medo-Persia. And according here, the goat, that came along next, that devoured the bear, which with Medo-Persia was who? Greece. And if you notice, that one horn was broken and four came out, right? 
four heads on the leopard, and the leopard is known as one of the fastest animals. How did the goat run? So fast it didn't touch the ground, right? Representing on how Alexander the Great conquered quickly the known world. And so instead of Alexander's son continuing, which he didn't when he died, his four generals continued conquering, and there it mentioned four horns that continued. And then it talks about the little horn, which also continues on with the beast there in Daniel 7. So he is given the interpretation. He is given the interpretation, but notice, he is given the length of the reign of this power here. There in Daniel 8, 13 and 14, our scripture reading. How long was the reign to last? There 13 and said that, Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to it, that certain one who was speaking, How long will the vision be concerning the daily sacrifices and transgression? And then verse 14, And he said to me, For 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. You see, Daniel was familiar with the year and day Bible principle. He was familiar that in Bible prophecy, a day equals a year. A day equals a year. And so Daniel was familiar that 2300 days actually meant 2300 years. 2300 years. You see, how did this affect Daniel? You may think, well, big deal. Look at the end of chapter 8. After he gets the whole vision, and gets the interpretation, the last verse there in 27, and I, Daniel, what? Why did he faint? Did he forget to eat breakfast? No. I fainted and was sick for days. Afterwards, I arose and went to the king's business, and I was astonished by the vision, but no one understood it. The vision affected him to the point that he fainted and was sick for days. You see, in Daniel's mind, he's thinking 70 years. 70 years. And then he gets this vision of 2300 years and it throws him off. You see, Daniel doesn't understand yet that God isn't talking about an earthly sanctuary, but a heavenly sanctuary that he's cleansing. Daniel doesn't understand that. He's just seen the earthly Jerusalem and everything here on earth. And he is so confused. He's thinking, 70 years. God said, 70 years. And now, 2,300 years? He just faints. He's confused. The vision shook him up. His trial is testing that God knows what he is doing, friends. And your life is based on learning that when you can't figure something out, God has already figured it out. When you can't figure something out, God has already figured it out. You see here in verse 27, I was astonished by the vision, but no one understood it. Not even Daniel. He got the interpretation. He got what they meant and, and the kingdoms of the ram and the goat. But he's not understanding the timing. And the first point I want to mention or make this morning is that the vision of God, the truth of God, affected Daniel's life. Has God said that he is coming soon? Yes. He is. He has said that. He has given us signs. We've seen those signs and we've seen those signs progress and progress. Has it affected your life? Yes. Amen. God bless you, Donna. Has it affected your life? You see, we have so much information as Adventists, don't we? So much. I would be so bold to say that the Seventh-day Adventist Church has more information than any other church. Amen. But has the information affected your life? Has the doctrinal truths that we know affected your life? The state of the dead, what happened to the dead, has that affected your life at all? Amen. I hope so. The second coming of Jesus, has that affected your life? Yes. How about this prophecy here of Daniel 8? Of Daniel 8, <clears throat> I'm sorry. Yes, Daniel 8, 13 and 14, the 2300 days prophecy. You see, we have so much information as Adventists that we can repeat it all. 
And we, and we know this prophecy of, of the 2300 days, it begins in 457 of the decree and ends in where? 1844, right? And we can, re, we can show all the different dates and can give all the information. But has that information even affected you? Has it even changed you? Just a little quiz here. What happened? If this, if this prophecy ended in 1844, those who, who have studied and are familiar with this, what happened in, in 1844? Jesus moved from the holy place to the most holy place, okay. And what does that mean? What, what has that got to do with my life? God is going over the books. God, what has begun? Judgment has begun. That's a, that's a Seventh-day Adventist doctrine, not to Seventh-day Adventist, that's a Bible doctrine. But friends, has it affected your life? Yes. Has knowing that judgment has begun since 1844 have any toll in your life? Or is it just another doctrine, another truth, and you just continue moving on with your life as if nothing is happening? Has it affected your life? You see, this truth that Daniel got, it affected his life. It shook him up. He, he fainted. He fainted. He didn't just say, oh, 2,300 more years, okay, whatever. He was confident. We were just here for 70 years. Now this 23, it throws him off and it makes him sick. Has God's word affected your life, friends? And God has here Daniel waiting on him. God wants Daniel to wait on the Lord. In, in Daniel chapter 8, it tells us when he gets the vision, right? When does he get the vision there according to Daniel chapter 8 verse 1? In the third year of the reign of Belshazzar. That's still, that's still Babylon. That's still in Babylon times. Belshazzar is the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. And that's still during the Babylonian reign. He gets the vision in, 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 in Belshazzar's third year. Now it's not until the end of Daniel chapter 9 that God explains to him the 2300 days, the sanctuary message, and everything that we today know as the sanctuary doctrine. Not until the end of Daniel chapter 9. How much time do you think passed from when he got the vision in Daniel 8 to Daniel 9? Well, the Bible tells us there in Daniel 9 verse 1. In the first year of who? Darius. Now, <laughs> we're talking about a whole different kingdom. What kingdom was Darius ruling over? The Medes and the Persians. Let's just pause there for a second. You see, in Daniel 8, verse 1, in the third year, he is given the vision. He is not given an understanding until the first year of Darius. There is approximately 13 years between the third year of Belshazzar and the fall of Babylon which is the first year of King Darius. Approximately 13 years. God waited 13 years to give Daniel the, in, the meaning and the interpretation and explanation of that vision. Of that vision. You see, God rushes when He wants to rush. And until then, He wants us to wait on the Lord. He wants us to wait on the Lord. What did Daniel say there? I did not understand. He said that he, he continued with his business. And then verse 9, verse 1. And we think that, oh, it's just he gets the explanation right that same day or the next day or the next year. He gets the vision right there in the third year of King, of, of King Belshazzar. And in Daniel 9, in the first year of Darius, he gets the explanation at the end of verse 9. Thirteen years have passed approximately. You see, God uses time as a tool to shape us. As a tool. Isaiah 55 verse 8, God says, My thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are, my ways, nor are your ways my ways. As, for, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Don't question God, friends. If God wants us to wait, we wait. Daniel waited. 
13 years. I can imagine after the third year, fourth year, he's still trying to understand the, th the 2300 days. But yet he doesn't lose hope or faith. He, he's waiting on the Lord and waiting on the Lord. Sometimes he will make us wait on the Lord. You see, the Bible has a lot to say about waiting. Actually, David talks more about waiting than anyone else. If you go to Psalms 25, join me in Psalms verse 25. And as you're going to Psalms 25, David was anointed king as a young boy, as a teen. You remember that story? He was anointed king. Did he take, did he take the kingdom right away? No. Nope. On the contrary, 18 years later, he became king. David had to wait 18 years. But yet here it was anointed king by God. Forget by man, by God himself. The prophet came and the prophet said, God has chosen you, I anoint you to be the king of Israel. And what does God do? He allows David to be public enemy number one. And is persecuted by Saul and is running and hiding in caves, the king of Israel. And David has to learn to wait. And God is using that time to mold David, to prepare him to rule the, to rule the nation of Israel. Psalms 25, verse 3 and 4. David says, Indeed, let no one who waits on you be ashamed. Amen. Let those, who, let those be ashamed who deal treacherously without cause. Look at verse 5. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. On you I will wait all the day. And sometimes we wish it was a day. But God has us wait even longer. David there waited and waited for 18 years that he became king. So how about Psalms 27, verse 14? Psalms 27, a couple of chapters over, verse 14. The Bible says, David says, inspired by God, says, wait, the first word is wait, on the Lord. And then what does he say? Be of good courage. Don't get discouraged. Be of good courage. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage. And he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Wait. See, some of us have been waiting. Been waiting for a job. Been waiting for a spouse. Been waiting for a house. Waiting to finish a degree. We've been waiting and waiting and we may get to the point of saying, Lord, I'm tired of waiting. When are you going to give me this? When am I going to do this? When am I going to get this? Friends, let me just share with you a little story about your pastor. <coughs> there was a time that I waited on the Lord. A job was offered for me by a company and had given me and had, had hired me and when I go to show up, they say, not right now. And I was eager and ready to start. They say, not right now. We'll call you. And almost, almost exactly two years later, did I start. And meanwhile, I am waiting and waiting and looking somewhere else for work, of course. Looking and looking and, and still going back. But didn't you hire me? Yeah, you're hired already, but you got to wait. And I waited and waited. You know, God was working in our hearts, in the Charles home, to mold us and get us ready for when we would begin. So if God wants us to wait, friends, we will wait. You see, time is God's tool for shaping you and me. And part of the Christian walk is to wait. Part of the Christian walk is to wait. Job says there in Job 14, 14, I will wait until my change comes. Psalms 37, you're there in Psalms 
27, go to Psalms. I'm sorry, you were there. Psalms 37, yes. Psalms 37. Verses 7 through 9. David says, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. If anyone knew about waiting, friends, is David. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Cease from anger. What does cease mean? Stop. Stop complaining. Stop being angry. And forsake wrath. Do not fret if, if only, it only causes harm. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. Waiting. So if you're tired of waiting, friends, if you're tired of waiting, you're tired of being a Christian. Because Chris, part of the Christian walk is to wait. Aren't we waiting for the second coming? <laughs> we are waiting for Jesus to come. Part of the Christian walk is waiting. You see, time, time for us is not like with God. There in 2 Peter 3 verse 8, God says, 2 Peter 3 verse 8, it says, With the Lord... With the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. Now some have, have gone to the length of interpreting that one day equals a thousand years for God. That's not what the Bible is saying. And in, in the context of 2 Peter chapter 3, the Bible is saying that time is not measured like we measure it. It does not say with the Lord one day is a thousand years. No, is as a thousand years. That, that, that means for God... Time can come and go and it's not like us that we measure time and, and there are changes within time. And we can see change within time, can't we? Sure. Just look at yourself in the mirror then look at yourself again five years from now. You'll see change. Or look at a picture when you were younger. Don't you, you won't see change? Yes, we measure time. God, for God, time is not measured like we measure it. So that's why if God wants us to wait, we shall wait. But we should, we should not be discouraged, friends, because there's good news, and I'm going to end with the good news. We should not be discouraged or depressed because we've been waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. But actually, we should be happy and thankful. We should be happy and thankful. You see, you see, some of us are in our 50s and 60s and we haven't overcome our temper yet. Some of us are in our 20s and 30s and we still lie like we were when we were, when we were 10 years old. We should be happy, friends, and thankful because the truth is, the truth is that God is still waiting on you. You see, it's not about us waiting to get what I want. God is still waiting on you and me. On you and me. It's not just us waiting on God, but God waiting on you. And God is waiting on me. God is waiting on us. And friends, He doesn't have to wait. But He does. He waits on you to love Him. He waits on you to praise Him. He waits on you to obey Him, to trust Him, to spend time with Him. God is waiting on you to say you're sorry. God is waiting on you to repent. God is waiting on you and me to get it straight. God who controls time waits on me. Why? He tells us he told us right there in 2 Peter where, where we were, 3, verse 9. Because he is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's why he's waiting. God doesn't have to wait. He could end this right now. But he is waiting 
because he does not want that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I am thankful, friends. I am thankful, and we should be thankful that God does not deal with us how we deal with our children when it comes to waiting. How do we deal with our children? I know how I deal with mine. You got five minutes. You got five minutes. That better be done when I come back to the table. Hurry up. Didn't I tell you? You got two minutes now. Thank God, God does not deal with us how we deal with our children. Can you imagine if he did? Can you just, just picture it if God dealt with us how we deal with our children? You know, if God were to do it, <laughs> just puff that one more time, see what will happen. Just puff that cigarette, see if you wake up tomorrow. Imagine if God did that. Just drink one more of that drop of liquor. Just drink it. Imagine, friends, really picture it. Just hold your ties and go on your vacation instead. Just hold it and see what will happen next time you go to work. Friends, praise the name of Jesus Amen. that he does not deal with us the way we deal with time. God is loving and patient and is waiting and waiting and waiting. God uses time as an appeal and as a tool. And there, the second half from your meditation from Christ's object lessons, God says through his inspired prophetess, we have no time to waste, no time to devote to selfish pleasure, no time for the indulgence of sin. It is now that we are to form characters for the future. We have no time to waste. Friends, I want to end this morning making an appeal. Some of us have been coming to church And you know the information, you know the, the doctrines of the church. You know what the church believes and you even believe it. You accept it. You say amen because you see it in the Bible. Not because the church says it in its beliefs book, but because you see it right in scripture. But yet, you don't make that full commitment of becoming a member of the church becoming a member of the church. Has God's doctrine affected your life? Has it affected your life to the point that you want to join His remnant church? Or is it just truth that just is floating out there? Friends, I want to appeal to those. To those that have not made a, dec a decision of becoming a member of the Seventh-day Adventist church and asking you, what is keeping you? If it's, if, if it's doctrine, come and see me and we'll study the Bible. If it's not doctrine, what is it then? David says in Psalm 95, Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Don't harden your heart. God is waiting. And he's using time as an appeal. He's using time to try and to reach you. Trying to reach you and to reach me. In these last days, friends, we will need to learn to trust God and trust His time. Amen. And trust His time. So if you're not a member of the Cleveland First Seventh-day Adventist Church, if you're not a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, period, while we're singing our closing hymn, the Savior is waiting. I want to ask that you come to the front. I would like for you just to give me your name. If you are not a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and God is waiting for you, and you already know the Bible truth, you already know the doctrine, you've been coming for months, you've been coming for years, but you're holding out, friends. God is appealing to you and is waiting and waiting. You see, don't forget that there is a devil out there that wants to kill you. 
Don't think that you will have any day to come to the Lord. God is waiting. Let me pray for you. Father in heaven, Lord, time belongs to you. Our time belongs to you. Lord, forgive us whenever we have used time wrongly. Whenever we have wasted it. Father God, there are people here who know your Bible truth. And for some reason or another, you know their hearts, you know their reasons. Just hold back in becoming a member of your church. This is your church, it's not mine. And so, Lord, as we sing this closing hymn, may your Holy Spirit work with those who need to make that decision in becoming a member of your church. Bless the rest. And Lord, help us to always keep in mind of how we use our time because it, it, it is, as we've seen, what you will ask of us. So Lord, again, forgive me anytime I have wasted my time. And forgive us as a church. Forgive your people. Bless us this on your holy day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.